Ago munya suma me Meden kai dia ye ye Anena sa menya me ansa Visa na du muntio Adu muntini atiasia Namada na sia wi anu Ako ni 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 ti na mo she mo e e ma mo ni na transe na ade ba ko am pese ye hunu ne se abra nya me e bo wi ase ni na no wade mra no wade chechiri wi ase en ko ha en fa sa di Anti bini, ini na ya mra. Oman kosu ni ya wajina mra so. Abu siya ya wajina jina mra so. Anti mra ti akutre, awa ya sitre. Anti ana sampani fushi ya mune. Akuni ni ni tini biya ya ba be siya mena eke ya huwa bum aya nokra ba ni soa emia se ni pa mi eno soa emia huma ni soma minti na tumi eno nam inti akuni ni ni tini wedi ya jumpa inti adamasi oni ya jumpa. Chini ba benya hufaswa, ana nomse mjina ba mani ya nyamfu minti, enuinti ni asuma me, visende, eni epa, amle nyamfu, ekuwe, yapa hutoa, ni wianswa ya bedu mukasa chile, na yangu yana, wakasa chile yangu. Ya bama ni nyamfu obi Bama ni mede Edi ya ya de fula no Ya ono abo Kwa jo Opa mkruma Opa ncheku Mkruma da saye Bama ni mede Ono wakasa Timi wuse Obesi ya dia wengine pampa. Adia ba kuwa mesi ya wamini ya kuma ya hupa nese. Asembi na waka, asamu na nusha na. Asamu na waka, nini ni pebi ya wajana chini? Ne bunum, e pe ma kuti ya kujenga zao. Ana biya ya tete wano kujua. Ni ya tunsa fla wone sabla ba kasa anu yenyampa ni kwa juu ya chini sse ukoa yano kwa swaba ukoa yano kwa ya juma pa wamse mlanu au sisi yano mprate sse dia. I am not know in Kita Dee. Eh, who? Fisa touched my oja. Touched my oja. Touched my idea. And the trunk, sir. And quack. And what will our touch a man some? Kodaka San Fiedas and Sony Chile. Uncle called to that. Fisa, I had to tell you. Maya ni mti ya biya me pesa metu. Me nsebra. Kwa biyo buwa buwa hon. Ne ncha metu nsafre ho. Minyo mune niye. Minyo ya no mwe. Mwumra me jusu mame.
Let's give him a big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and I can assure him that when I'm done with politics, I'll probably go back into full-time practice. <laughs> I want to start by acknowledging a number of guests who are here with us um, as we launch the Gimpa Law Alumni Association. The Honorable Minister for Tourism at Sankota is with us, the Honorable Ibrahim Awal. Let's acknowledge him with a round of applause. Thank you very much, Senior, for being here with us. The Honorable Minister for Youth and Sports, the Honorable Mustafa Yusuf is here. Let's acknowledge him as well with a round of applause. The Honorable Deputy Minister for Information, the Honorable Fatima Abubakar is here. Let's acknowledge her. The President's Advisor on Communications is here, Madam Oboshi Saikofi. Let's acknowledge her as well. Former Minister for Media Relations, Madam Elizabeth Ohine is with us. Let's acknowledge her with a round of applause. The President of the GJA, Albert, is here. Let's acknowledge him as well. Professor Stephen Adai is here with us. Let's acknowledge him with a round of applause. And a good old friend of mine, who is also here with us, the former Director of Communications at the Office of the President, Koku Anyudoho. Koku, thank you for being with us this afternoon. <laughs> Rector, deans and faculty, staff and students, colleague, alumni, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I am honored, first of all, to be back here at Gempa today, a place that holds a very special place in my heart. And on behalf of all my colleagues in the alumni who are here, we are grateful to you for the investment that you made in us. And we assure you that we'll do our best to serve our nation with the skills that you imbued in us. When Dean Ajman Budu explained why the faculty wanted me to deliver this lecture, my mind went straight to one of my recent experiences. It was in August 2019. I had just entered a high-level meeting around 4 p.m. at the Energy Ministry. Two hours earlier, a decision had been made to suspend the agreement between ECG and PDS. I was here at this meeting to be briefed on the decision. And then following the brief, I was to come up with how the nation should be informed. And at the same time, assure the people of Ghana that this decision will not cause disruption to jobs and salaries. The first thing I remember was asking myself a few questions. Legally, who is mandated to suspend this agreement? And who should be briefing the country about this matter? How do I answer the questions that I will be asked following this? And as I go forward to say that it will not lead to a disruption of salaries and jobs, am I even sure that this decision will not affect jobs and salaries? How does a decision like this affect perceptions about governance? Professor Adai, in the last five years, staring at the photos of about 35 information ministers who have come before me, I've asked myself questions like this any time a major matter comes up and I'm required to speak to it. I've always wondered what has been going on through their minds in the moments that they are called upon to communicate governance. How did they grapple with the law and the practice in this field? This afternoon, I will share with you some of the answers that I found as I lead the discussion, a legal framework for communicating governance. And I'll approach it by adhering to this outline. First, I'll define some concepts. I will invoke the literature that underpins our discussion. I will propose a theoretical lens through which we can examine the legal framework. And then we will do a proper examination of the legal framework. But I believe there are some matters beyond law that we also should discuss, after which we'll do some analysis, make some recommendations, and then I'll conclude. So let me start with the concepts. Valensas and Bruni in 2014 argue that the word communication finds its origin in the Latin word communis, signifying common. The etymology tells us that communication is about making something shared, known, common, mutually understood. 
it was Severs in 2009 who posited that governance is about effectively managing a nation's resources while upholding fairness, transparency, and accountability to citizens. It is the foundation of development, promoting accountability, and responsible leadership that elevates living standards. Vedding and Van der Dolen in 1998 wrote that government communication is only a policy tool. It's a means for government to explain her policies and programs to the population. And when it comes to legal frameworks, we are just referring to a body of laws that apply in a particular country. That gives structure to the relationship between the state and the population. So, Dean Ajiman Budu, this big topic that you gave me, if I simplify it, all that we are going to talk about is how a body of laws affects the exercise of creating common understanding about the governance processes and its activities. But to enable me to do justice to this afternoon's subject, I had to consult some oracles. So I had to consult two oracles. One was literature, and then a group of experts. From literature, I found the models of reference and the lens that we'll be using for this afternoon's analysis. And from the experts, I found insights in the views shared with me by people like Mr. Kofi Totobi Kwache, a former Minister for Information, Elizabeth Ohene, a former Minister for Information, Suleiman Abraima of the Media Foundation for West Africa, Professor Margaret Jan, academic at the University of Ghana, Mr. Koku Anyiroho, who I've mentioned, is here with us. He is a former Director of Communications at the Office of the President, Nana Kumia, who is a former Minister for Information, Kessel Atuforsen, who is the minority leader in parliament currently, Kwesi Ameyao Cherme, the former majority chief whip or deputy chief whip, all of whom have been involved in frontline communication of governance for the last 30 years. I've also been speaking to Madame Oboshi Saikofi, Mr. Mahama Ayariga, Nana Yaokese of Peace FM, and Beatrice Sedu of Asasi Radio to get perspectives. I did so because if between literature and all of these people, we cannot draw useful lessons, then Rector, maybe we should close and go home because we won't find the answers that we are looking for. We'll try. Let me start with the literature. The four theories of the press first outlined in 1956 are namely the authoritarian theory, the libertarian theory, the Soviet communist theory, and the social responsibility theory. Now, whereas these theories are derived from the point of view of the press, they are assumed to be substantial enough to facilitate a typology of how different governments communicate because the practice of media is informed by prevailing society. And you'll find that in the 1999 work of Rose Smith. Quickly, let me touch on these models. So the Soviet communist model, as explained by Sibet and his colleagues in 1956, has at its core the concept of complete state ownership and extensive control over various forms of mass media. This control is vested in the hands of selected party leaders facilitating government communication. And you'll find an example in North Korea. That's where state-controlled news agencies are the exclusive purveyors of information. And then there's the authoritarian model, originating 16th and 17th century from England. This model involves stringent content control by the state, limiting public freedom to critique governmental policies. It differs from the Soviet communist theory in terms of media ownership, because this one rather allows both private and public ownership. In China, you find this model operating. But content is highly regulated by the Central Propaganda Department of uh, their ruling party. Then there's the libertarian model, which also takes its origins from European liberal thinking. It advocates media freedom devoid of government intervention and enables diverse perspectives. Media ownership predominantly resides in private hands. And this theory underscores media's role in information dissemination. It is from this theory that you get the argument made that the media is the watchdog over government. You find places like fin Finland um, exemplifying this. And then finally, the social responsibility theory. Emerging from the libertarian theory, this theory does not advocate unrestricted media use. It mandates adherence to professional standards and ethical codes. 
Media ownership primarily remains in private hands, guided by established standards, codes of conduct, and overarching principles. And you find it in France, Germany, the US, Japan, and many other places. Now, in Ghana from 1957 till now, we have been swinging between the extreme left and the extreme right, depending on the political order. Under military rule, government communication was characterized by centralized control with high-ranking officials such as the head of state and the minister for information disseminating information through public statements and declarations. The military regimes tightly controlled the press and media, considering communication crucial to their role often tying it to national security and intelligence. For instance, it's reported that the National Redemption Council had the Ministry of Information and the Publicity Secretariat, which we now call the ISD, placed directly under the authority of the Chairman and Head of State, Colonel Ignatius Kutua Champong. There are also times in our history where it is reported that the Minister responsible for information also had an eye over national security coordination. Under military or authoritarian regimes, governance communication was primarily directive in nature. These regimes manipulated information to project positive government performance and suppress public opinion. Differentiating governance communication under military rule from what we have today, Suleiman Abraima, executive director of the Media Foundation for West Africa, told us when we interviewed him that communication under military governments is really about directives. You obey before you complain. In terms of even the media legislative landscape, there are differences from then as compared to what you see today, following the repeal of the criminal libel law, establishment of the National Media Commission, etc. In contrast, under the democratic dispensation, governance communication has evolved into a more fragmented landscape. Various arms of government, including party communicators, parliamentary groups, and communication around the president have become prominent sources of government communication and the proliferation of media outlets, almost all of which are privately owned, has significantly challenged agenda setting. The advent of smartphones and social media have also raised the bar even higher. And when it comes to the importance of communication to governance, I believe we all know it already. But Madam Elizabeth O'Henney puts it succinctly when she spoke to me ahead of uh, pre uh, the preparation of this paper. I hope I don't misquote you. She says, I think it's helpful to have the president agree with you largely on the importance or otherwise of communications. And I don't know at which stage you get the whole government to agree on the priorities that have been set because, and here's the important part, if there's general agreement that these are the priorities, then it is easier to communicate from there on. Secondly, governance communication also provides the channel through which all stakeholders, citizens, interest groups, civil society and media can engage with government and make input into programs and policies and participate in decision making. It is when we fail at this particular one that you hear after a major announcement, people or stakeholder groups will say, we're not consulted. And then in times of crisis or emergencies, communication is most essential. Active, clear, frequent communication is what enables crisis managers take timely decisions and shape behaviors. In Ghana, I'm sure that in COVID, you recall how it was handled. Um, public education campaigns are important because they help to create awareness about key issues like taxes, responsibilities, etc. And then for international relations, it's important to ensure bilateral and multilateral cooperation, but sometimes it makes the difference even between peace and war. So simply put, governance communication is the glue that brings together all the pieces of governance. Now I want to briefly speak to the theoretical lens that we'll be using this afternoon. There are a few theories that are relevant to the discussion before us, but the one I want to employ is the agenda setting theory. This theory enjoys considerable attention within the governance, communication, and media literature. It was McCombs, in his work of 2004 and 2018, that suggested that political actors deliberately strive to elevate certain issues, ensuring their prominence within public discussions. It entails the media's selective curation of specific issues, vigorously highlighting them through recurrent coverage, thereby cultivating a public perception that accords paramount importance to these issues. Simply put, it may not be the only or even the most important story of the day, but it is what the key political actors choose to highlight. That's what the agenda setting theory is. So let me give you an example. In the last two weeks, a number of things have been happening here in Ghana. For example, Cocoa prices have gone up by about 63%. At the same time, or in these same last two weeks, you will find that the president has been meeting the National House of Chiefs. 
inflation has dropped marginally. The president has been handing over about five speedboats to the Ghana Navy. Also around the same time, the president is been commissioning first oil from Jubilee Southeast Project. And oh, by the way, Parliament has been holding an inquiry on a tape uh, purported to be evidence that the IGP uh, is being planned to be removed. Now, can you imagine which of these became the main agenda for public discourse through mainstream media? That's the evidence of the agenda setting theory. So to best examine the legal framework and its implications, I propose that it's important to examine it through the agenda setting theoretical lens. This is because the relationship between this legal framework and agenda setting is what determines the ability of the framework to impact governance communication. So now let's look at the framework. I group the framework into five parts, or I separate it into five parts. Um, for the first part, I deal with the Constitution. For group two, I deal with laws around, sometimes it's a Ministry of Information, sometimes Ministry of Media Relations, sometimes it's a Ministry of Communications, sometimes directors, advisors. There are laws around that that I'll deal with. Group three, I deal with what I call the transparency laws, like the RTI Act, the Whistleblowers Act, etc. Group four, there's a group I call the wingmen. They come in to help. Political party, constitutions, and the standing orders of parliament nominate what we call party communicators and then members of parliament on the floor of parliament. So there are some laws around them as well. They also affect agenda setting and therefore governance communication. And then finally, I deal with what I call the free media laws, like Article 167 in the Constitution. So let's start. We run an executive presidency in Ghana. But before I go there, if you go into the Constitution, I just focus on about five articles of importance. And starting off, you know we run an executive presidency in Ghana. The President of the Republic is the one clothed with power to exercise executive authority. Exercising executive authority includes the responsibility to communicate what is being executed, what is being done, the expected outcomes, whether we are succeeding or failing. There are also express provisions that require the president to perform specific communication assignments in furtherance of his or her governance mandate. So for example, if you take Article 67, the president is required to appear before parliament to give what we call the State of the Nation's Address. Article 36.5 requires that the president within the first two years should submit to parliament the agenda for governance. That's known as the Coordinated Program for Social and Economic Policies. Article 179 requires that the president's budget be laid before parliament. And then under Article 78, the president can nominate other persons as ministers to handle various portfolios. Here's what happens. Anytime any of these provisions is in execution, agenda setting becomes very easy and governance communication becomes very easy. Take, for example, if the president's state of the nation or the budget is about to be read or a key policy announcement is to be made in parliament by a minister responsible for that portfolio, automatically it makes the front pages and everybody's talking about this. So my analysis about the first group of laws that you find in this legal framework is that they are clear, they are express, they are exhaustive, and they facilitate agenda setting, which is necessary for communicating governance. Come to the second group. You notice that sometimes a president may assign somebody else with responsibility to complement the communication of governance. And studying this, you'll find that various heads of government have used about three different approaches. There's a group of presidents who over the years appoint a minister responsible for complementing communication of governance. Sometimes they call him the minister for information. Sometimes they call him the minister for media relations. Sometimes they give him another name. This appointment is backed by an executive instrument. And there are other times when a president may elect to assign an already existent minister this additional responsibility. I'll share some examples shortly. When that is done, no executive instrument or instrument of legal force is given this other minister who is performing this role. And then there's a third scenario in which a president may assign an advisor to advise on the communication of governance. In this instance as well, no instrument of legal force is issued. It may even be at the same time when a ministry backed by an executive instrument is existing, supporting with that same function. 
So in an instance like this, de facto, the responsibility may be assigned to a higher political person, while de jure, a lower political person, may have been established by EI to execute this. So let me give you a few examples. In the Jerry Rawlings administration between 93 and 2000, you will find Kofi Totobi, Kwache, Ekos Gabra, John Dramani, Mahama serving as ministers of communication. In the John Kufu administration, Madam Elizabeth Ohini was appointed as minister for media relations. The Mills administration returned to the information ministry model and designated Zita Okaikwe, John Tia Akologo, Fritz Bafo as ministers for information. And then they had Koku Anyidoho at the office of the president as head of communications. In the John Mahama administration, Mahama Yariga, Minister for Communication, was given the additional responsibility to function uh, in this role. Later, I beg your pardon, Mahama Yariga was initially Minister for Information. Later, it was collapsed, and then you find Dr. Mani Buama, Minister for Communications, being given this additional responsibility. Let's come to the Akufuado era. In the Akufuado one era, the Minister for Information was also the presidential spokesperson, Dr. Mustafa Abdul Hamid. His successor was Minister for Information, but not Presidential Spokesperson. In the Akufuado II administration, a Presidential Advisor, Madam Oboshi Saikofi, was then appointed to advise uh, to assist in this function. So between 2009 and now, the Republic has used about six different approaches in identifying the person and trying to figure out what the role should be. But here's a more important thing. On the substantive matter of the legal framework, it appears that whether a ministry is established by EI, or an additional responsibility is given to another ministry, or directors and advisors are appointed, the proper legal instrument, a legal mandate, authority, and clarity on the spheres of influence are not provided. The EIs, and this is because the executive instruments that establish ministries in Ghana don't spell out the mandate of the ministry. They just mention the name of the ministry. One would have thought that where the EI doesn't provide that clarity, you will find it maybe in the Civil Service Act. When you go to the Civil Service Act, you'll find that there are no such details as well. In fact, Section 12 of the Civil Service Act only outlines how a ministry should be structured, finance and administration, planning, monitoring and evaluation, HR, and I think statistics. So what is the effect of this on agenda setting and governance communication? Professor, Professor Margaret Ivijan suggests that in situations like this, you have different centers of communication, and it's a recipe for failure. Nana Kumia has a view on this. He says, when you have a unified structure, somebody at the top, and then everybody is fine, then command and control is easier, and resource channels are much more defined. And so it will be easier to identify where non-performance comes from and deal with it much more easily. Mr. Koko Anyidoho has another view. He says, when you have appointees who are in the ministries, especially Minister for Communication in charge of, let's say, government communication, but ultimately, who are you communicating for? You are communicating for the president. And so, in that structural arrangement, here's a minister or the ministry that wants to be autonomous. Why not? But here's the director of communication who is knowledgeable in his field. He has a strong understanding of what he wants to do, manages the president, writes the president's speeches, and is at cabinet meetings, and is at virtually everywhere the president is. Not everybody is going to want to enjoy that kind of relationship. So you come across as being overbearing, but it's not overbearing. But this just shows sometimes the tension and the differences and the difficulties. And here's my analysis. The second group and the laws around them are less effective than the previous one in facilitating agenda setting. And this is because it lacks clarity, and actually sometimes it can create some more confusion. Let's deal with group number three, the transparency laws. The Right to Information Act, for example, Act 989, the Whistleblowers Act, Act 720. Now, with the coming into force of Act 989, information regarding governance has become a matter of proactive disclosure. This is the disclosure of information without having to wait for a request. Under Section 2 of Act 989, the government shall make available to the public general information on governance without an application from a specific person. I dare say that this facilitates agenda setting and by extension aids government or governance communication because it allows you on your own to determine what to put out proactively and to shout it out for everybody's understanding. But it's worth mentioning that the ITI Act also has the potential to be used by other parties to fetch information for their own agenda setting purposes. Such purposes, though 
forming part of governance communication may cause embarrassment to the administration of the day. And I can give a few examples. For those in the MPP, you'll be happy to recall the bus branding saga of the NDC. And for those in the NDC, you'll be happy to recall the Christmas tree saga at the airport under the MPP. It's a double-edged sword for agenda setting both ways. And then finally, let me talk about the wingman piece of legislation. With the increase in the number of radio and TV stations as our democracy has strengthened, other players have become very relevant in the communication space and will become even more relevant moving forward. Party communicators on one side, MPs in parliament on the other side. Party communicators rely on the party hierarchy for legal authority and direction in accordance with party structures and sometimes party constitutions. MPs rely on caucus leadership in parliament sometimes, but very often they rely on their own research and their own messaging devices. If you wake up or you stand up and you catch the speaker's eye, you say what is on the top of your mind. I have two views, one from the Honorable Chairman and one from the Honorable Atoforsen to share on this. The Honorable Chairman says, if it is a matter emanating from Parliament, everybody will prefer that Parliament deals with it. If it's a matter affecting the Presidency, then let the Ministry of Information or the Communications Bureau deal with it. If it's a pure party matter, let the party leaders speak to it. But the ideal situation will be to have a coordinating committee involving the Office of the President, the Ministry of Information and Party so that we are all one. The Honorable Atu Forsen has a slightly different view. He says that this is the Parliament of the Republic of Ghana. We have people that are knowledgeable and experienced in various sectors. This is the office of the Minority Secretariat, and at the time he was speaking, he was in his office. So we sit here, we write, we collate ideas, we bring forth the position of the caucus. When there's a situation, we bring our ranking members together like a mini cabinet. We discuss the issues, we form a position, and then we articulate the position. It is commendable, and here's my view, that the wingmen hold autonomy. But the limited collaboration results in their underutilization in the broader task of agenda setting and communicating governance. Finally, let me speak about the media freedom laws or the free media laws. The liberalization of the media ownership landscape in Ghana has created a good number of television, radio, online, and print platforms. The data from the NCA suggests that we are heading towards about 700 radio stations, over 100 TV stations, and thousands of online broadcast channels and print publications. Now, while this presents opportunities for governance communication, it can also pose challenges. As the private media outlets prioritize their economic interest and editorial discretion over government messages. Here's a view shared with us by Nanai Alkesi, news editor of Peace FM. He says he's a private sector operator. He must ensure that his audience is served the way that he wants to serve them, not the way that government wants him to serve them. And so if government puts out releases, for example, videos of a presidential speech, if he wants, he can look at it and decide what is in it for him. Is it something newsworthy? And you can imagine if he doesn't feel it's newsworthy, then whatever government decides to communicate will be missing in the scheme of things. Beatrice Sedu of Asase Radio has another view. She says that I think media possibly is more successful in setting agenda because if the media decides to set agenda to bring a government down or to help a government, it could because of how it goes ahead with it, how persistent it goes with it, and well, mostly if it's able to gather the facts, then it gets to convince the people who are listening or watching the more. Yet, Article 167C of the Constitution and the NMC Act prevent the government from exercising editorial control over any state-owned media outlet. Now, this was totally understandable when Ghanaians only had access to state-owned media. But I want to raise a question. After nearly 700 radio stations and 100 TV stations, is it still okay that government does not operate even one channel to set its own agenda. And I know you say GBC and a few others, but today's state-owned media is not under the editorial control of government. They respond only to the National Media Commission. Now, while we claim fidelity to Article 167, government still has unfettered access to its own social media channels. Is that state-owned media or not? For example, we see the new police TV channel and its very laudable content. 
which helps the Ghana Police Service to set its own agenda. Even if mass media is not interested in carrying what they want to put out because they think it's mundane. Is that state-owned media? Does it offend Article 167C? Or do we admit that it is a necessary tool for agenda setting under the current developments? My friend Koku has a quote that I refer to. He says, he segmented the media into two, private and state. With private, you can't really do much because the media owners have their own agenda and the presenters have their own agenda. But with public media, um, you may be tempted to have a conversation with them to carry the government agenda forward. But technically, any attempt to exercise editorial influence over state-owned media is unconstitutional. But is this provision still appropriate in the midst of the current developments for purposes of agenda setting? So here's my general analysis. There are parts of the legal framework where there's clarity. And those parts allow for more coherence in communicating governance and participating in agenda setting. And then there are parts of the framework that are ambiguous and lack clarity. They lack authority for the persons who are supposed to operate in there. They create a more difficult hurdle to overcome. I'm happy to inform you that having noticed this, the Office of the Council to the President has commenced efforts to propose a review of parts of the Presidential Office Act and the Civil Service Act and the executive instruments for setting up ministries. This should bring some more clarity and impetus for the purposes of governance and communicating governance and agenda setting. Administratively as well, the current managers of government communications have made efforts to collaborate closely with party communicators and MPs to facilitate agenda setting and the communication of governance. It should therefore be relatively easier moving forward to have all, as they say, sink from the same hymn sheet. As against sometimes different people saying different things on the same matter. But for agenda setting to be effective, a number of non-legal matters also need to be attended to. And I will speak to only five and end my submissions. The first is information sharing for communicating governance. The second is ensuring inclusivity in communications. The third is how we measure the success of communications. The fourth is managing crisis comms. And finally, how to deal with misinformation and disinformation. So I'll start with information sharing. Information sharing within government is one of the most important, yet most difficult ideals to achieve. And I see grandma smiling at me. Traditionally, information has been managed on a need-to-know basis. For example, while many people believe that the information ministry or the party communicators who come on TV or the MPs have all the information on a particular matter, that is never the case. We only work with the briefs from the sector ministries, departments, and agencies. So unlike the president or the sector minister, we are limited to what information a specific sector minister is willing to share. Akumia has a quote on this. He says, there used to be a scenario where nobody was providing information until a crisis came. And he gave details. He said they had a situation where the entire student movement in the country were up in arms over inadequate monies that have gone through get fund. They quoted what was in the budget and what the Minister of Finance had told the country. And they students said the money can come. And they, the students said the money that came was not enough. It was a big matter for government at the time. Initially, they were not getting information. But he goes on to say that because it was a crisis now, it was easy to get information. Everybody was willing to come around the table and provide information because it had now become a crisis. But ordinarily, you will struggle with this. Stringent efforts, Rector need to be made to break the silo mentality in information sharing if agenda setting is to succeed. And pursuant to this, in 2021, the Ministry for Information, um, with the help and direction of the President's Advisor on Communications, introduced an online information sharing platform for ministries, departments, and agencies. The government has also subsequently instructed that all ministries should proactively provide information onto this platform to improve information sharing. In the coming years, we expect that this platform will help to reduce, if not totally eradicate, the challenge of information sharing. Let me talk about inclusivity. It is not a matter that we have approached over the decades with full attention, I must confess. 
apart from a sign language interpreter in Parliament, you will recall that it was only during COVID comms that we actively focused on translations into local languages and the regular use of sign language. To the extent that inclusivity is not a dominant approach in governance communication, our ability to set agenda among people who speak minority languages and people with communication disabilities will always be at the mercy of private media for them to translate. And as you know better than I do, a lot can be lost in translation. Quickly, let me speak about measuring success. Madam Obushi Saikofi perhaps put it most succinctly for us. She says, I think the only way you can succeed in measuring is through proper research, data, and management, and analytics. It's easy to say what has to be done, but it's an expensive component of communications management. I want to speak to the subject of human and material resource capacity. You see, governance communication often faces budgetary constraints. Proper funding is essential for effective communication, even for communication research. She goes on to say in the last quote that I gave that in our part of the world where budgets are always very limited, it's difficult to assign enough in the budget to these measuring tools. It's very important, but it's difficult to assign enough budget. So I think we fall low on the measuring tools a lot. Nana Kumia has some views. He says, very often, government has not seen communication as important enough in the allocation of resources. So if you are uh, running a communication outfit, you must fight for resources. In 2019, for the first time, we succeeded in creating a budget line for government communication at the Ministry of Information. And we expect that moving forward, this budget line will distinctly be funded to facilitate the execution of agenda setting objectives. Let me speak to crisis communications. Ghana's response to COVID-19 was widely commended for its transparency, collaboration, and proactive communication strategies. A comprehensive assessment of countries' responses to COVID-19 was presented in a publication led by Professor Darren Lileka, an expert in political communication at Bournemouth University. It ranked Ghana and South Korea at the top of their evaluation. Suleiman Abraima, Foundation, Media Foundation for West Africa, acknowledges the success of government's communication of COVID-19 in this way. He says, I think it was strategic. It was well planned. The president's occasional addresses, speeches from health authorities and other government officials on how you know, you know these are extempo speeches, we are dealing with impact and how we are managing the crisis and all that. I think it was a very good example of how government can communicate around issues. Here's my point. The comms approach we were allowed to deploy for COVID should be allowed to be deployed for all regular communication of governance. And Koku has a view on that one. He says, in crisis management, you have three Ps. You pity, you praise, and you promise. You can choose other language for it. Maybe showing empathy or commending, and then you give hope. And then he goes on to say, when I begin to pick up those elements in the president's crisis communication, Hello, Ghanaians. We are sorry about this happening. It's unfortunate that this number of deaths, blah, blah. I've spoken to the Ghana Health Authority. I've spoken to the police. I've spoken to the military. I congratulate the battle is the Lord's. This too shall pass. In these three segmented cabins, he satisfied the basic core principles of crisis management. And I remembered exactly why, where I was in Ho when I first commended the president that as far as I'm concerned as an expert, if I were writing the crisis communication speech for President Mills, I would have put... I would have done exactly what the president did. Koku couldn't avoid bringing President Mills into this one. <laughs> Rector, I want to wrap up on the subject of misinformation and disinformation. Misinformation is false or inaccurate information, and disinformation is false information which is deliberately intended to mislead, intentionally misstating facts. You find details from the American Psychological Association's publication. Now, in a study conducted by Audrey Gajeko, Gilbert Tieta, Abena Enimua Yebo Abenin, and Daniel Kwame Ampofoje on how journalists in Ghana covered the COVID-19 vaccines, please pay attention to this. Journalists stated that they were guided by sound practices such as source credibility and relevance, but betrayed weakness in their verification practices with a third a third admitting to sharing unsolicited or unverified information from social media. You'll find that in the 2023 publication of Professor Audrey Gajeko and her colleagues. 
A third. Honorable Chairman says, and he says this of one particular matter, the PDS matter and its communication. He says, the real intentions were declared to the people. But in a country where you have a minority that opposes every single thing that you want to do, it seems to me that the public bought into the misinformation of the minority than the information that we of the government side were churning out. Misinformation and disinformation have a real potential, ladies and gentlemen, to even collapse our entire democracy. It is worrying that media admits increasingly falling prey to misinformation. Even more worrying is how a few political actors on both sides are also increasingly guilty of disinformation. Let me speak briefly about sincerity in communicating governance. Communicators of governance should be sincere at all times. Because in particular, we live in the post-truth era where faith in political leaders has been eroded and we must make extra efforts to be sincere at all times. I admit, sometimes we may get things wrong based on the briefs that we have been given, but we should never deliberately go out there to mislead the public. We should also encourage the mainstream media to focus more on unearthing the fact for the public to make up their own minds and less on personal opinions and commentary. For political and civil society actors, we should bear in mind that if we keep investing so much in undermining each other's sincerity, then we should not be surprised if the public forms the view that all of us are insincere. Even our charges at each other should not be full of lies and concoctions. They should be genuine and fair and based on the truth. Rector, I want to conclude with a few recommendations. Number one, the parts of the legal framework that are ambiguous require some urgent clarity and efforts to secure amendment that bring clarity should be sped up. Number two, the cabinet instructions to all ministries, departments, and agencies to share information to facilitate agenda setting should be enforced. Number three, efforts to improve inclusivity in government communications through sign language and interpretation into local languages should be maintained and even mainstreamed. It should be the norm and not the exception. Number four, the template developed for crisis communications during COVID should be reviewed and utilized regularly. And finally, we need to build some consensus to deal with the growing threat of misinformation and disinformation. And this should be done quickly. And consensus is necessary because it's a slippery slope. You might infringe on press freedoms. It might be viewed incorrectly politically. And so there is the need for consensus to be built to deal with this, and it should be done quickly. Chairman, if you invited me today to speak to the subject of a legal framework for communicating governance, I hope my thoughts will help advance this field. In the coming years, I look forward to joining us here as we hear from other alumni on the interplay between the law and the practice in their own fields as well. I'm grateful for the opportunity. In terms of structuring the communication, first of all, there must be a lead. If it's the ministry, let it be the ministry. But I think the ideal situation would be to have a coordinating committee involving Office of the President, Ministry of Information, Party, and Parliament, so that we are one. My the recollection is that there was no structure, that we made it up as we went along. The spokesperson for the president or incoming president was assumed to be the spokesperson for everybody. And so I do not really 
support that kind of centralized complication. I can support a form of clearing house where you want them to clear policy announcement or pronouncement. May 9th was the football match between Hearts and Kotoko. And that was bad. The people of Ghana needed to know as quickly as possible exactly what happened, how it came about that so many young people died, that if we found out what had happened, then we could take put in place things to ensure that it didn't happen again. So that was, that was the crux of what we were supposed to do. In crisis management, you have three P's. You pity, you praise, and you promise. Choose other language. You show empathy. You commend, then you give hope. It's important to get the people on your side, so you Yes, you want them to be aware, but you want them to, as much as possible, accept and come on board with what you're doing so that they can be part of it and so that they can understand what benefits will accrue to themselves and to the nation as a whole. Um, the truth to avoid crisis is when we confront the situation head on from the beginning. I'm a great believer in, you know, I got this wrong, I'm sorry. and. I'm a great believer in that. Something is bad, it's bad. Even within Parliament, you can't centralize it. You can't say that um, every single thing must go through the office of the minority leader. You need to get that aspect of your, your appointment right so that when that person is managing, the other colleagues don't see the, him as just oh, one, of the, one of us politicians. Oh, no. We think one of us if confirmation means no. Or oh, a professional. He's a professional. That the important thing was that the whole government should be seen to be singing from the same hymn sheet. A structure or a non structure where you have different centers of communication. Oh, that is, a, that is a recipe for failure. One important thing about uh, political communication is for you to be singing from the same hymn sheet, whether you are true or false. Now, the number one agenda setter is government, because it is believed that government have the resources. And Sometimes the opposition also come into the fray. Government generates whatever issues that need to be discussed. But it is the media that picks it and mirror the society and then made the society to understand which part of the economy is government tackling most and tackling less. ISD played a central role. And mind you, in many of the communication lines political. You, you had a situation in this country where the deputy minister was telling ISD people that they should go and lie. If the thing is black, they should say it's white. And if the government gave 10,000, they should say it's 50,000, which of course is not going to be possible because these are civil servants. You know. But then, so then with this mindset, they will sidestep ISD and go to their own communicators. It needs to be re engineered. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I believe we can give the Minister of Information another round of applause.
I had no doubt in my mind that he was going to deliver, and indeed, he delivered beyond my own expectations. But of course, that's what a Gimper education does. So it's not too surprising. Mr. Minister, we're not done with you. I would respectfully invite you um, to come on stage for us to have a little chat, a fireside chat. The questions you put to Madam Oboshi, Sai Kofi, uh, Madam Elizabeth Ogni, I'm coming to put the same questions to you. Um, so please, respectfully, if you could join me briefly. Uh, we're not going to um, be long. We'll just um, take a few minutes um, to have a conversation. Let me start by saying I reserve the right to invite help to answer me some of the questions. <laughs> this is not an open book exam. It's a closed book. It's a closed book one. Um, thank you once again, um, um, Honorable Minister, for um, that um, insightful lecture. Indeed, I learned um, a lot from it. My own understanding of agenda setting had been influenced by what we hear. Um, in recent times, we hear things like um, some particular um, journalists being agenda setting individuals, but in a negative sort of sense, um, like agenda nyame and, and things of that, so which I know you know what I'm talking about. Um, but my first question to you would be, in light of the agenda setting theory, that theoretical framework that you used in your delivery, at what point would you say that in communicating governance, you or whoever is given that task should say, I got it wrong, or we got it wrong, we are sorry. So there are different parameters. First, I'll deal with the matter of agenda setting, and then I'll deal with um, you know, admissions. So agenda setting is not a bad thing. In fact, if you speak to any media practitioner, they'll tell you that the first part of their job is to set the agenda. Because the media is the one that determines what you see on the front pages, what you hear on the radio, what you'll be thinking about. And like I tried to demonstrate, you can have a thousand things going on in Ghana in a particular week, in that particular week. It was one-sixth of the things that was going on that had to do with the probe in Parliament. And the other five things which we believed were developmental, helping the country, and pushed very hard to be covered, the media will tell you, like some of the media persons told us, ah, this one won't get me the audience, this is what will get me the audience. So that's what I want to cover live. So the media admits, you know, agenda setting, but I think my point is that government should not be shy of getting involved in agenda setting because the only way you can communicate governance properly is by participating in agenda setting. Mm. It is a question of the tools at your disposal uh, to help set the agenda. And some of those tools are legal, like we looked at, some of them are financial, um, uh, some of them are even constitutional, and that's why I raised Article 167C, that maybe we should start asking that question again. At a time when we had only one GBC and one or two newspapers, it was understandable to say the media should, should not, or government should not have any say in it. Does that still pertain today? I don't know. Um, the second part of your question has to do with admissions. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think, as some of my seniors mentioned, where we have gotten it wrong, we should be able to say we have gotten it wrong. Um, and sometimes we get it wrong for various reasons. You may get, as I demonstrated earlier, we are not the substantive sector. We yeah. get briefs yeah. every evening based on what we think is going to make the headlines the next day. We get you know, issues raised, and then we try to get information. Mm -hmm. If you don't get the right brief, you may go out and say X or Y or Z, only to find out the following day that what you put out was incorrect. And at that point, you should be able to say, I got it wrong. Mm. There are times also when you may genuinely not get it wrong, but somebody else in the political ecosystem wants to create an impression that you got this one uh, uh, wrong, and therefore you should, um, may I say, admit and mm. apologize. And you'll find persons who communicate to governments insist that, no, I didn't get this wrong. So um, I think it's dependent on the scenario at play mm. that you would act accordingly. Mm. So should government communication be centralized? Um, I am not really worried about the model you use. Mm. I think for me what is more important is that the authority relationships, the mandates are fleshed out clearly mm. so that you can bring everybody together, as they said, sing from the same hymn sheet and we can all be one. 
in particular the growing wings or the wingmen as I describe them will even become more important as our democracy grows and it's important we fashion out a way that brings all of them under one umbrella. Mm. One of the, the main uh, would I say accusations or one, one of the main things that usually um, your government and in particular um, your ministry is attacked uh, or, or uh, is hit with is the fact that it seems as if a lot may be going on, but you're not effectively communicating and that people um, do not know what is actually happening. So for instance, in 2020, I remember um, that there was this delivery tracker, which was more political than governance oriented. Um, and I'm happy that you mentioned that there was, a, there was now an information sharing platform and all those kinds of things. How do we practically, using this theory that we've just um, been exposed to, streamline government communications in a way that is effective, not necessarily to um, push any political agenda, but the developmental agenda of the country which we are all interested in? I think the first thing is closer collaboration for information sharing within um, government, uh, so that you're able to get a lot more information that you need uh, for the purposes of agenda setting. I think the second thing is to examine the, uh, um, the tools and the infrastructure mm -hmm. at your disposal. Mm -hmm. In fact, in the last same week uh, that we are talking about, for those of you who have been paying attention to television, you've been seeing a lot of Agenda 111 projects being shown on yeah. your television. You are seeing a lot of uh, things about, um, uh, I think, um, uh, cocoa pricing and uh, uh, forums that are going on being showed on your television. That is because, like I said, in the constitutional provisions, the ministers responsible for those sectors have shared information. So it makes it very easy to put it out. Mm. And if you have other spaces where um, there's a difficulty in sharing information, you will have a difficulty in putting it out. That's the first one. The second one has to do that. Even when you uh, have it, how much does it cost to get airtime across five or six or eight television stations and put it out there? Because in reality, you don't control any channel. Yeah. GBC charges me for putting my things um, you know, on television, and it's understandable. And that's yeah. why I say that, for example, you've got to take a second look at Article 167C yeah. and ask if it's still relevant today. Mm. Um, closely related to that, you mentioned in your presentation um, laws such as the right to information um, law, the whistleblowers law, and you group that in one category for the purposes of your analysis. Um, how, in your opinion, and um, in line with this theory, agenda setting theory, which I'm getting used to now, um, and it's exciting my own intellectual um, um, path, how do these um, laws influence public perception in terms of um, governance. I, in your experience, because you're in the Ministry of Information and haven't seen through the passage of the RTI, for instance, would you say that it has helped in terms of our governance generally and in terms of um, communication of governance? So they have the potential, in particular the Right to Information mm. Act has the potential to significantly improve the communication of governance. And particularly if you pay attention to the proactive disclosure part of the act, which require uh, ministries, departments, and agencies to very regularly on their own, even when nobody has requested for information, set the agenda by proactively putting out there what they are doing about this and what they are doing about that. We have the devices at the Ministry of Information ready to support um, any of those functions. But it means that people who run all of these public institutions, because mm. the law talks about public institutions, first need to know the law, second need to pick it up, and based on that, do a lot of proactive disclosure. Because if you don't, there's another part of the law that allows anybody mm. to come searching for information and to use that information for whatever purposes. Mm. And I say that that is even part of agenda setting in governance. Mm -hmm. Except that often when people are look, looking for that information, they are not looking for that information to, to, for to, purposes, to, yeah. to promote mm. the you know, work of government or for the communication of governance. They are going to use it to say, of all the 500 things you have done, here's one example of something that went bad. And oh, by the way, that means you are so, so, so bad. 
And how do you respond to something like that? Well, it is the law, and it allows them to do that. It is part No, I mean, how do you respond to, yes, you've done 500 things, that's wonderful, but somebody points to that one thing that you didn't do, or you haven't done well, or you've done wrongly. Because, how would you respond to because that? Because that person is setting their agenda, is framing issues or seeking to frame issues mm -hmm. in that way. The onus on us on this other side is therefore to profusely use this side to set agenda to push out there what we have done. Mm. And as I've mentioned, that depends on the collaboration. That demands, depends on how much interest people in the system have in supporting communications so that they can make all of this available. I mean, if you are doing something great in your ministry department or agency, it must be in your first interest that we want the world to know about it. Mm. But if you are doing something great in your ministry department or agency and you would not open up, you will not share information, it would take a miracle for anybody to help you communicate mm. the kind of governance that you're exercising in your part of the bigger ecosystem. Mm. All right. Um, so I have a few questions that have come in, and we're wrapping up this um, conversation shortly. I have a last question for you, but uh, let me read um, one or two questions that we're getting um, um, from our live stream on GTV, um, on Adum TV, um, and CTTV as well. So um, an individual called Grace says, Ghana is a secular multicultural state. The different cultures we have reflect the diversity of approaches to communicating and being communicated to. As so as a government so as a government mouthpiece, I believe there's a critical consideration of these cultural contexts in communicating governance. So the question is, how can we incorporate our cultural dynamics into this proposed legal framework? So the information services department is the one that helps us to answer that question very well because the Information Services Department focuses on what we call below the line communication, on the ground. Um, above the line, we use a lot of mass media, social media, digital tools. What does below the ground communication mean? So there is what they call the visibility line. Mm -hmm. And above the line is what everybody can see. So that's what you see on television, here on radio, on billboards, in mm -hmm. print, that's above the line. And then we have what we call below the visibility line, where you see on ground. Mm -hmm. So in a community, maybe in the church or in a school or in a mosque or at the chief's palace or under the baobab tree, how do we gather? Mm. And using the local cultural nuances, do the necessary communication as is required. And that's why I say the ISD is the uh, vehicle that is best placed to help us be culturally sensitive mm. uh, within this communication framework, agenda setting and everything else. The challenge over the years is that successive governments have not invested enough in the information services department. And it's something that we need to take a lot more seriously and invest in so that they have the capacity to go to every village, community, wherever, and get the message to ground. Because if you assume that doing one press conference in Accra means the person in Hamili has understood it in the local language, then we are deceiving ourselves. Mm. But what are the tools or the devices that we are making available so that we can turn that message, that press conference from ECG and PDS, we can turn it into the Sicilian language for it to get to the person on the ground so that misinformation and disinformation will be cured. Else that gentleman will be there and somebody will come tell him that the government has taken um, um, this particular asset mm -hmm. and has sold it to itself. And there's no means of getting communication to him to clear that misinformation or disinformation. And that will make the communication of governance almost impossible. Mm. Um, one more question. Um, so this is coming from Peter. He says, we were not consulted, has become a popular mantra in our public discourse in recent times. From the announcement and rollout of the DDEP, that's a domestic debt exchange program, to issues surrounding COVID expenditure and the fight against Galamse. How do we as a country balance the need for urgent communication on issues of national concerns with the necessity to consult extensively in governance communication in a democracy such as ours. Does the existing framework provide any guiding perspectives on that? That's a section B A level question. <laughs> 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 um, I think we have to go back to the very top to understand that communication. I think one of the, by the way, um, in 45 minutes, I cannot even quote everything that all the resource persons I spoke to um, you know, shared with me. And I'm informed that um, all of those are being put together yeah. in a final publication, which will be uh, peer reviewed yeah. and then published with an electronic version as well. Yeah. In that, one of the persons we spoke to, um, I think it was Akomia, makes the point that we need to get to the point that we have a clear understanding that communication is at the heart 
of the entire governance exercise, even right from the very beginning when we are formulating the policy or the program, we need to get the comms people, we are very experienced comms people in the room to understand what it is we want to do and even to troubleshoot for us that this one will mm. not go well, this one will not go right. In fact, there have been times when it has taken communications people in caucus detail interview to prevent major national security disasters because they were able to piece together a few things that they were picking up mm. in the communication arch um, architecture. So it goes to an understanding right from the very beginning. And it is when we don't do that that you hear people say we were not consulted. Mm. It's when we operate in the old model of information is on a need to know basis. basis. That then stakeholders in the ecosystem and other people don't know. And you can have a nice ceremony to make the announcement, but everybody will say, we we're not consulted. And now you have a PR crisis on your hands. Mm. The problem is not a PR problem. The problem is a substantive governance problem that needs to be um, tackled that way. Mm. Um, so finally, um, um, Honorable Minister, in conclusion, the Ministry of Information, the Directorate at the Presidency, responsible for um, information or presidential spokesperson and all that. What is the way forward? What is the model, the ideal model in your world that should be adopted? Because we went through several, you pointed out in your, in your lecture, several different models. And even from 2009 to date, we've gone through six different... Oh, six different ones. Six different yeah. ones. <laughs> Who knows? We may have a seventh one. <laughs> <laughs> so my question, my final question to you is, which one of these six or which other iteration of any of the, the, the six would you prefer? I think the current system is the best system, where you have, you know, along the four parameters, different people in charge, and then you have a supervisor at the top mm. um, who is able to help bring coordination uh, so that we, we all first know the hymn book yeah. and then the hymn sheet that we are singing and the hymn from. number. And the hymn number. Mm -hmm. Else when you say hymn 111, <laughs> if some people are holding the Methodist hymn book and some are holding the Catholic hymn book, you'll hear different songs. Together, yeah. um, so I think the current model is um, the best. And that's why you'll find me mention that the current model has helped us to unearth a lot of gaps. And it is from this that already conversations are going on about the amendment to the Presidential Office Act 